Um, I want to thank the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Community for inviting me today. And I also want to thank Kevin and Mike for setting up my presentation. Um, my job is going to be really easy because they've already covered a number of the concepts that um, we wanted to discuss today. So in talking about phosphorus and soil health management practices, I just want to mention that um, the work that we're uh, I'm trying to get my, yeah, there we go. Uh, the work that I'm going to present today comes from two publications, basically literature reviews that we produced last year. And I want to thank and acknowledge the, these authors, Emily Duncan, Amy Schober, Laura Starr, Peter Tomlinson, John Tovar, Tom Mormon, Heidi Peterson, Nicole Filarino, Keith Reed, Andrew Sharpley, and also Dana Hogue. These um, papers and URLs you can find on the Livestock and Poultry Learning, uh, Environmental Learning Community webpage. And so with that, let's talk about soil health. Um, soil health is defined in lots of different ways. It just depends on who's defining it. So you might have it defined as an ecosystem or you might have it defined as a set of met metrics or tests. These are two current soil health tests. But to date, there's really no standardized soil health assessment that's been developed. Generally though, when people are talking about soil health, they like to talk about soil health practices, cover crops, crops rotation, reduced tillage, and continuous plant growth. And so I wanna talk about soil health and water quality. And the question is, if we have healthy soils, will we have perfect water quality? Will we reduce non-point source pollution? I have gone to meetings where people have said that if our soils are healthy, then we won't have any nutrient losses. However, I'm gonna just cut to the chase and I'm going to really put my conclusion points up front. Uh, Kevin and Mike have already talked about this. Conservation practices have nutrient loss trade-offs. You might reduce nitrogen, but increase phosphorus. You might increase sediment, uh, sediment attached phosphorus, but increase soluble phosphorus. And soil health practices are really just a subset of conservation practices. And so they too are gonna have nutrient loss trade-offs. And as Kevin already stated, it's incredible incredibly important for us to use systems of conservation practices where soil health practices are part of that suite of practices, but they cannot stand alone to solve the problem of agricultural non-point source pollution. So I wanna talk about controlling phosphorus. There are three loss pathways, sediment attached phosphorus through erosion, soluble phosphorus through runoff, and of course, either sediment or soluble losses through leaching. It depends on the soil type and uh, the systems that are there as to whether you have soluble sediment or both. And then I wanna talk about two other controlling factors. One has to do with soil test phosphorus. And again, Kevin already um, mentioned this, as well as source, source control, which he also touched on. So let's start with soil test phosphorus. Soil test phosphorus is not necessarily an indicator of phosphorus loss. Um, if you look at this slide, you'll see there's almost no relationship between malic 3 p and phosphorus runoff. However, all things being equal, we see that as soil test increases, we have increases of, of uh, phosphorus loss. And Kevin already showed some of these data. Soil test levels are usually not part of soil health practices. Typically, people don't mention them. And when you're measuring soil health using one of the soil health tests, typically there's no penalty as your phosphorus levels escalate. And so it's really important to think of soil test phosphorus when we're considering whether or not soil health practices can reduce phosphorus losses. So again, Kevin already alluded to this. There are many, many studies that demonstrate that phosphorus stratification occurs in the surface soil, the very top part of the soil, 
the longer that conservation tillage goes on. Now, these two practices, conservation tillage on your left and cover crops on your right, are the two soil health practices out of the four that I presented that I'm really going to be focusing on. Because again, if you have cover crops, then um, in theory, you have a living root all year long. Now, the data that I'm showing you is not long-term data. It's very short-term data. Um, and I'm showing you these data because I want to make another point further into this presentation. But they looked at different kinds of fertilizers. I'm just showing you um, the treatments with DAP, an unfertilized treatment. They put the fertilizer on the surface. They disc the fertilizer in. They also put the fertilizer on the surface at, with a cover crop. And then they added fertilizer at approximately 10 kilos per hectare um, every year versus about 24 kilos per hectare every other year. And the phosphorus stratification, the top zero to five centimeters, the five to 20 centimeters, was um, actually much higher under the disc situation, which is not what you would find in long-term no-till. They think it's an artifact of this being a very short couple year experiment. But the point was to show you that phosphorus stratification exists, just as Kevin showed you that phosphorus stratification exists. And so when we're thinking about soil health practices, uh, we have to be concerned about higher soil test levels in the surface. So we, when we talk about erosion control, we have a number of different practices. Again, the two soil health practices that we're gonna be talking about throughout this presentation. We have things like terraces and grass waterways, riparian buffers can be useful as well as wetlands. These are just some of the practices we can use. Now, this is data from Darianto. They did a meta-analysis and used anywhere between 40 and 126 data points. And it clearly shows, um, now I'm sorry, I think uh, it, oh no, it, this works. Changes in phosphorus concentration is on the left-hand boxes. Changes in phosphorus load are on the right-hand boxes. And what it clearly shows is that conservation tillage reduces particulate P. It also reduces total P, but not as much um, as the particulate P. That's because conservation tillage or no-till actually increases soluble P, both the concentration as well as the load, um, which is the reason that you typically have the total phosphorus losses are not quite as significant as the particulate. But one of the things to keep in mind is that it's the soluble phosphorus that's bioavailable to the algae. And so we have to be concerned as we see our soluble phosphorus losses increasing. Now, this is a data set. It hasn't been published yet. Nathan Nelson out of Kansas State was gracious enough to, to allow us to use this particular slide. He also has data from 2018. It shows exactly the same trends as he's seen in 2016 and 2017. But in an experiment where they had no cover crop and cover crop, they were able to see upwards of a 70% decline in erosion due to the cover crop. When they looked at their particulate P, they were able to see approximately a 40% decline in particulate P. So they were fully expecting their cover crop to show a reduction in total phosphorus. And I'm gonna talk about that um, a few slides from now. But in addition to the soil health practices, we need other practices. We need these stacked practices that Kevin was talking about. And this is some older data, but it shows very clearly that sediment gets reduced through vegetative buffers and can be very effective in uh, slowing down the sediment attached phosphorus. Now we're gonna to move to our runoff control. And we've already seen that conservation tillage does not reduce soluble phosphorus. So that picture is not on this screen. What we have left is the cover crop with the question mark associated with it. And then we have these other practices. So controlled drainage, or as some people call it, drainage water management may reduce runoff of phosphorus. 
um, these systems where water runs over slag and it absorbs the phosphorus can be an excellent off-site practice also. So let's look at the effects of cover crop on phosphorus loss. We see that, again, this is the Kansas experiment. They saw an increase of dissolved phosphorus of 65% when there was a cover crop. And so at the end of the day, they really saw no net effect on total phosphorus loss. There are a number of other papers that have shown increase in soluble P from cover crops. There are a few papers that have shown um, really no change with cover crops. Particularly, I no noticed there were a number of people from Canada on this call. Um, during freeze thaw cycles up there, it looks like cover crops as they die and the cells lice can release soluble P2. The last thing I should say is the studies where they've looked at animal waste and cover crop, it, it appears that the uh, signal from the animal waste phosphorus loss really overwhelms any signal that you might see from the cover crop. So this is phosphorus reduction from controlled drainage. This is some data out of North Carolina. Um, actually, North Carolina developed controlled drainage. Our controlled drainage looks a little bit different than it does in the Midwest because we have ditches rather than tile drains. But you can see that surface runoff uh, phosphorus transport was reduced as well as subsurface drainage. So the last loss pathway is leaching control. These are some data from Pete Kleinman. Um, on the, the left figure is cumulative loss of total dissolved phosphorus. And on the right um, uh, figure is the cumulative loss of total phosphorus. So one's dissolved and one's total. They had four different soil types. This is from the coastal plain of Maryland and Delaware. Some of them had high phosphorus status, some of them had low phosphorus status. They leached them and looked at the phosphorus leaching losses. And that's really why I'm showing this slide is to show you, you see these leaching losses as you increase the amount of water you put through the system. And then after the manure is applied, you see these different patterns depending on the fertility of the soil relative to phosphorus leaching. So this is just demonstrating that phosphorus leaches. Um, Kevin has all kinds of data showing that phosphorus leaches. And uh, these leaching losses are, I think, probably a little bit differently, though, because on these coastal plains soils, you just get soluble phosphorus moving. Uh, there aren't any cracks or root channels. It, they just tend to move through the sand. And so when we look at, and we think about conservation practices with leaching controls, it's few and far between. We cannot stop draining our soils, otherwise we don't have agricultural productivity. Um, and, and so again, one of the things we can do is use controlled drainage. Kevin talked about the different tillage types they've used and the different tillage depths, and it appears particularly on well-structured structured soils that some tillage might be useful, but of course this is the antithesis of um, soil health practices. So I also want to talk about source control. Um, and this is, again, the work done by Doug Smith, looking at the gap and the unfertilized situation. And the reason I wanted to pull this in is that if you look at this load, the soluble phosphorus load, it's actually the disk treatment that has the lowest soluble phosphorus load. There's really no difference in total phosphorus, but there is a difference in this disk. So again, it shows the trade-offs between having surface applied fertilizer that might be put on conservation tillage system and having the fertilizer disk bin. So to get back to the comments that Kevin was making, it's critically important to look at the relationship between the four Rs along with these soil health practices at the same time. And then the phosphorus loss versus phosphorus applied was much greater for the surface applied phosphorus than for, and, and, the, and that includes also the cover crop than the disk system. So Kevin talked about this, Mike talked about this. It's incredibly important to use systems of conservation practices. 
we've been talking about systems of conservation practices uh, since the early 90s. And about 10 years ago, NRCS started uh, talking about stack practices. You want to avoid, avoid the problem. So in the case of phosphorus, if your soil test says you have plenty of phosphorus to grow a crop, don't put any more on. It, you want to control the phosphorus. And so in thinking about soil health practices, we can control some forms of phosphorus through conservation tillage and cover crops, but we have to recognize that we may have trade-offs between sediment attached phosphorus and soluble phosphorus. And then we have off-site practices that can trap phosphorus, such as the slag systems that um, I already mentioned, or riparian buffers. Now, one of the things that I should say about riparian buffers is that they're pretty good at reducing sediment at attached P, but in some cases, they actually are a source of soluble phosphorus. And um, there was a really good um, literature review that showed that buffers can go from being a sink to a source. So we really have to take this into account when we're th thinking through our conservation practices and systems. Um, Kevin mentioned this and I wanna reiterate it. It's incredibly important. This was some data put together by Tony Buda. I very much appreciate him loaning me this slide. And it shows that up in the area where Kevin works, there's been over 40% increase in extreme rainfall um, in about the past 40 years. In the Northeast, it's even worse, 55%. And in the South, it's around 30%. Having lived in North Carolina now for over 30 years, I can t attest to the increasing frequency of particularly the hurricane systems we're having. So there's, there's been these changes in storm frequency and duration and the amount may increase phosphorus losses. I think Kevin already showed some of that data. Mike also talked about how these increasingly um, strong storms can really change the effectiveness of our conservation practices. And, and we would just like to argue that conservation practice design may be insufficient for new conditions. Conservation practices weren't designed for the practices, for the, the systems we're in right now. And so we need to rethink that and double down on making sure we're using stacked practices. The last thing um, I want to mention, and again, Kevin already alluded to this, is that we are going to have lag times in our systems for phosphorus. We're going to have lag times in our water. We're going to have lag time in our soils. Um, here in North Carolina, our average soil test phosphorus is three times more than we need to grow a crop. So we need to get the phosphorus out of the systems, and that may take decades before we start to see any improvement in water quality. So the last thing I want to leave you with, and I, and I already started the, off my presentation with this conclusion, is that there are trade-offs with all conservation practices. So all health practices are just a subset of conservation practices. They're going to have these trade-offs around, particularly around phosphorus loss, um, looking at soluble phosphorus losses versus sediment attached phosphorus losses. And with that, um, I'm actually done. Um, if any of you have any questions, I would highly suggest that you read the papers. And of course, my information is attached to those and you can get up with me uh, personally if you have any questions. And thank you very much.